Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing the importance of symphony orchestras with special guests, Elise Brunel, Executive Director of the Vermont Symphony Orchestra, Mieko Hatano, Executive Director of the Oakland Symphony, and Christina Littlejohn, CEO of the Arkansas Symphony Orchestra. Thank you all for joining us. It's wonderful to see you. We've got the entire United States here represented, uh, or at least the, uh, the symphonic world uh, represented. Symphonic classical music comes from an aristocratic and European tradition that is a far cry from the lived experience of Americans who are neither aristocratic nor necessarily of European heritage. My, my family were, were peasants and they raised horses and they... Uh, they uh, they farmed and and uh, raised chickens. Uh, I'm not. I don't come from an aristocratic stock, although I do come from a European one. So we're confronting this this fact that symphonic music is really relevant, right? If you if if you play a video game, you're likely to be exposed to some form of symphony music of a classical art form. If you go and you watch a film, you're likely to hear the composer present them, present uh, a, a form of music that comes from uh, ancient European traditions. So at least you have a really interesting background. Could you talk a little bit about the state of symphonic music and symphonies in the United States today? Because we have this abiding um, uh, art form, but we also have symphony orchestras that have had some real difficulties during the COVID time and coming out of the COVID time in terms of engaging diverse audiences, youthful audiences, and so on. So you've got this sort of binary piece. Thanks uh, for having me on. I really appreciate it. Big question. The state of orchestras in America, starting from a big, uh, a big point. Uh, so from my point of view, I, I came to Vermont a year and a half ago, having run um, uh, the opera company down in Cape Town, South Africa for quite a long time. So talk about taking an art form in a place that you don't expect it to come from. Um, fortunately, down there, we had amazing singers, singers who were just amazingly predisposed to that art form. And why not? Why not do it? So I was fortunate to come here to Vermont um, to get into the orchestral world in America and at a, at a place in the country and with an orchestra that's been around for 87 years and at a time where I think everyone's willing to, you know, with COVID and the restraints of COVID to say, well, what can we do? Not so much what have we done, but what can we do now? And I'm so really- So it's very much of a future, for, uh, yeah. COVID required you to look forward, not so yep. much back is your point. Absolutely. And you, I, you know, very few of us had a choice to say we can't do anything. Everyone said, no, what can we do? And if it meant segmentation, it, if it meant, you know, suddenly becoming filmmakers where none of us had done that before, that's what it meant. And we were all pushed into an arena to make a lot of wonderful mistakes, which ended up in musical brilliance, some messes, but it's okay. We kept creating music with incredible musicians. And I think we're coming out of that um, in a stronger place. I, I just wanted to pick up on what you were talking about where orchestral music is is almost hidden in plain sight. Um, I, I was thinking about there. there's a film Sing 2, which has a Prokofiev Romeo and Juliet piece in it. Why not? You've got, you know, you've got orchestras that are actually gaming orchestras, ones that just play music. Oh, you have gaming. guitar players? Why you have, not? You have yeah. rock guitar artists quoting Bach in the middle of yeah. their performance, right? And it's not as if it's not either or, it's both. So let's still do our symphonic works. Let's still do book, but let's do these other things as well. So I think it's an exciting time for orchestras to reinvent and, and continue what's great, which is creating that incredible music. But let's think of how else we can do it. Now, Mieko, you're on a you're on a other side of the country in a completely different setting, a completely different demographic. Are you finding that you also, like Elise, have to invent yourself out of this COVID period? And are you also finding that that sort of this this old the old reference points alone are not sufficient? How, how are you managing the Oakland Symphony? Again, big question. And Mark, thank you so much for having me on. It's great to represent the West Coast on your show this morning and to talk about this really incredible topic. You know, first and foremost, the art form of the symphony orchestra 
I mean, it is every bit of it, every sound that it is possible to make is a tool for us. It's a tool of expression. There's a reason that classical music or that style of an orchestra is used in movies because it can express feelings. It can express emotions. It can move people where the drama itself really is enhanced by music. And that's the same thing for our communities. Our symphony orchestra can enhance all of the lives and the uh, experiences of our community members. It gathers people into one place to be able to have shared experiences, and we can therefore understand one another better. During COVID, we couldn't gather anymore. And so we had to throw all the rules out the door. So all of a sudden, you know, people who were used to coming in, sitting down, being quiet, you know, all these golden rules that we talk about of, of experiencing a symphony orchestra in a concert hall went out the door. You're all of a sudden at home in your pajamas, you know, um, maybe stepping out for a moment just to grab some popcorn or something like that. But we all started having really different experiences with classical music. But most of all, we missed each other. And I think that that's why, you know, at least here in California, our state government is reinvesting really heavily into the arts because we're seeing that the arts were a healer. They were something that brought people together and helped us cope with our everyday lives in a way that we really took for granted. And so for us, COVID, we're seeing that we've been able to throw the rules out the door. People are more able to, to adjust to that. They're used to things being really different. And I think that they're finding ways that they can enjoy music and each other in really meaningful ways that they didn't even think about before COVID happened. So I, I love this point. This uh, It's a dual point. First of all, there's this cacophony that we're exposed to in today's media landscape. And classical music has a tendency to organize the cacophony into things that we can absorb, rhythms and, and forms and, and, and sounds that we can uh, absorb. So that idea of just sort of relax and enjoy Relax and enjoy. We have a complicated world. Relax and enjoy. If you want to do it in your pajamas, do it in your pajamas. And what you're saying is that we're going to meet you where you are and we're going to make this music accessible. Christina, how are you in, in Arkansas um, confronting these same kind of kind of issues? Again, we have three totally different environments, totally different uh, uh, sections of the country. How do you find this this uh, this situation in Arkansas? Right. Well, one thing I really want to push back on is the word classical. Like I believe here in Arkansas, we're a symphony orchestra um, and we're here to play symphonic music. And so there's a real there's we've really hurt ourselves, I think, by limiting ourselves to the word classical and having classical represent in our heads. It symbolizes for good reason, Western European or European music. Right. And there's a lot of great American composers and there's a lot of great American composers. One of them is Florence Price, who's right here in a native of Little Rock. William Grant Still is also a native of Little Rock. They actually had the same teacher. So I think to myself, if our legacy as in the symphonic world had not been quite so bigoted, like, I wonder who else she taught. Who was that teacher? Who taught Florence Price? Who taught Florence, uh, William Grant Still? And who else was out there? So. Well, how many female composers didn't get a get consideration because uh, of their gender, right? Uh, right. You know, those those kinds of issues. Exactly. Um, it's, we can correct so, those. Yeah, we can. And so I, I think one of the things we want to really embrace here is the idea of some symphony orchestra and how are we serving our community with symphony orchestras? So one of the things that we've done um, this season is we opened the year with a free concert. And so our free concert was free in the concert hall. And then we also did a simulcast in Dunbar neighborhood, which is the neighborhood where Forge Price um, used to live. And so we did a simulcast in that neighborhood and the program featured music of Florence Price, Florence Price being a concerto in one movement with her orchestration. And then it also included music of Aretha Franklin. And we had a wonderful singer also from Little Rock sing um, music from Aretha Franklin. We had a couple other singers on stage. It was a beautiful program. So it was a program designed to um, showcase what was great about what is great about Arkansas, showcase the symphony orchestra um, and make it so that it's just music right 
it's just music. So the concert, um, it was free, but the audience was very diverse. It was probably our most diverse audience I've ever seen, but it, and then there wasn't any kind of like, Oh, I only want to go to Aretha or, Oh, I only want to go here. Florence price, or I only want to go here for Cofield. It was everybody wanted to hear it all. Um, and so that's one of the things that we're working on is how are we, how are we, how are we playing music that isn't necessarily Western European and how are we putting them together? I love that. I love that idea. The idea that's that this this um, symphony and classical are so often uh, co-associated. Mm -hmm. right? But if you look at symphony, it's a it's a form. It's actually a structure. It's not constrained by who composed or, or what era it, it, uh, th these pieces are composed. And right. so that's why you have the reference points in 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 the modern era. Let me ask you all this this question, because Christina just made this this wonderful point that not only can you take a rock setting and start to play Bach, but you can take a Bach setting and start to play something else. Right. right. Um, how, how are you and Christina, maybe maybe you want to continue, but let's go around the table. Um, how are you leavening? the uh, and creating intersectionality pointing out the intersectionality between different musical forms and the symphonic form how are you bringing in more modern concepts and modern experiences at least you talked a little bit about film um talk a little bit about how you're you're approaching this christina you want to continue and, and then we'll sure. go around. sure one thing I, um we recently we just did a world premiere of tommy leon um it's called pasajes and tommy leon was here in town with us for a whole week. And we performed her work, our world premiere Pisaez, and then our string quartet also performed one of her quartetos. And one of the ways that, in Tanya Leon's music, it, Tanya's from Cuba, her music has a very South American flair. Her music is beautiful and incredible. And it was paired with Mozart, as it should be. But anyway, it was, one of the cool things was having Tanya in town to go talk to Park View, uh, our kids. So she spent a lot of time with, with high schools, with colleges. She worked with composers and some of our composers were like, I only compose jazz. And Tanya's like, come on, you know, like bring the jazz, bring the, you know, bring the folk music, bring it on, you know, bring the improv. So she did a lot of improv with our kids and helping them with improv. And um, I liked her idea of improv and cross pollination, like making sure that, you know, music is, about exploring and it is about listening to each other and learning from each other and making those connections. And so I think for us, some of the ways is just asking, you know, trying to hire living composers and getting them to help work with us. There's a lot of them that do explore the different, different genres um, and can help us with those conversations around town. And she did a lot with our donors and a lot with our um, subscribers who loved her concerts and got to know her as a human being. So I think some of it is just bringing in people that are that are different than what you might expect. Diego, how are you uh, um, uh, approaching this idea of intersectionality and community engagement? Oh, there's so much opportunity. You know, if we can get out of our own way of being these, you know, uh, institutions that are museums that we only do music from the European genre, like you, like you were just talking about, it's not that those aren't important. It's really important to be juxtaposing these things because you know, Beethoven, Brahms, I mean, they're the masters. They knew how to utilize the orchestra in ways that, that you know, people today are striving to, to achieve. Well, define, define <laughs> the art, right? But, but other people can have, have def redefined the art. I mean, look at, look at the work of film. Exactly, exactly. And so in Oakland, just like in, in Arkansas, you know, we're looking at how do we, why, why are we limiting ourselves with genres? I mean, we are an orchestra. We have, you know, it's a modern marvel of getting a hundred people together to do anything, to make any sound you want really, um, and to create emotional experiences. And so for us, um, you know, we're constantly juxtaposing jazz works, you know, giving our local jazz composers opportunities to compose for a full orchestra. You know, that's part of this too, being available to your community to experiment as well. Not just about the orchestra experimenting, but partnering with our community members, with community organizations, our, you know, our jazz organizations locally. What does this look like? 
You know, we did a, a concert that was half jazz, um, you know, newly composed works for orchestra, um, as well as, you know, Boito Mephistopheles on the first half with chorus. I mean, there's, and it was such a great concert. And we had two different audiences in the hall brought together to hear different, two different things, but they ended up experiencing one another's affinity. You know, they got to experience jazz if they're an opera lover. And if you're a jazz lover, you got to hear a really fantastic prologue. You know, just really, really fun. Um, we've also partnered with, um, you know, a fantastic artist in Oakland. His name's Kev Choice. He's really well-known hip-hop MC, but he's a classically trained um, and jazz pianist. And he, you know, orchestrates and composes for full orchestra. And we've actually done works by him. I mean, we, he actually premiered his entire, a, a full symphony called um, uh, a, a, a Symphony Restoration. And it was, you know, the full fourth movement recapped 90s, you know, alt hip hop in Oakland. And so it was something that people, you know, of my age, right? It was like, oh my God, that's, you know, that's my nostalgia. But it was in this setting of a very serious concert. You know, but there was this ability to relate to the music and to the symphony on stage through my own childhood, my teenage years. You know, it was it was really, really fun. But it's also showing what types of genres actually work with a symphony and, you know, why limit ourselves? There's so much opportunity to have fun with this and to create a truly American orchestra sound. I love this this idea Right. Where where instead of saying symphony is this and opera is that. Right. At least. Right. It's not, it, it's those those separations that Mieko was talking about, where you have voice performance within the environment of a symphony or a voice form affecting a symphony or a symphony affecting a voice form. Uh, those divisions really don't hold. You can you can go beyond that. So we we just finished uh, two polls. The first poll was how many people have attended recently, um, and only fifty percent of the people responding. And this is a selected audience, mind you, had attended in person a concert recently. So there is uh, a, a real fifty percent, even in a selective audience. Uh, there's a select a fifty percent opportunity. We're also doing another poll which is just ending. Symphonies are 30, 30 to 50 minutes in length and are mostly an oral experience. Are taste changing or do they favor multi-sensory experiences in ways of threaten symphonies? And um, we basically found that uh, a few people felt that no change is needed or symphonies are evolving at a very satisfactory rate, but half the people feel that they aren't. So what, what, what is your answer there? Are symphonies evolving at a satisfactory rate or do, you, or, or do we have to up our game at least? Do we have to take some of these, these ideas? And I'm kind of setting it up in a, in a tilted way, um, but, but please ignore, ignore my tilt. <laughs> I, I tend to be more in favor of constant renewal, uh, but uh, it's not, uh, that's not everybody's taste. At least how do, what, what is your answer to that question? Are we evolving at a satisfactory pace? I, I think we're evolving at a realistic pace. Um, and I think like opera companies and orchestras, the behemoths that we can tend to be uh, slows us down. Um, but also I, I feel very strongly that as an ED, um, our job is to create the space physically uh, to, and to put people together and get the money together and let the artists create the work. Um, that's our job and say, you go create the great stuff. So as long as, as we're providing that and, um, are forward looking rather than backward looking though of course there's plenty of things in the in in the past that are important i, I feel like we're being on a realistic pace um so I, it was interesting i was just in the prior question about you know the hybridization i was thinking the the two words that was coming to my mind was fusion cuisine um it used to be that you would go to the italian restaurant or you'd go to the you know very specific ones and now everything is fusion why would music not be any different we've got something coming up here where we've um we're spurred on by the whole fantasia thing back believe it or not 82 years ago was fantasia that long ago <laughs> but the notion can you believe it of what do you look at and what do you listen to at the same time um and so we we're working with a projection mapping company to do a, a concert that ranges from rimsky korsakov and barber to you know contemporary composers like jeff scott and mark lomax and doing an hour-long visual projection and con, con, um, classical classical music concert um the whole notion of to upset the apple cart of what you're listening to 
could and should be matched by what you're looking at. It's something different. So it's so interesting to hear the stories about jazz and opera and also, you know, maybe moving out of the venues that we perform in. Um, Christine, I know you opened a, a new art, uh, a new center recently down there. I believe there's a new performing arts center. Um, was that down in Arkansas? Well, we're working on, um, we, we announced that we are in a fun drive for a new music center, a community music okay. center. And so it'll be a space for, um, we have a lot of music education programs here at Arkansas Symphony. In our current facility, <laughs> our kids are having to practice outside, like we just don't have enough room. And so we are about 60% done with our fundraising for our new music center, which will be nestled in between Clinton Library and the Heifer International so, you know, that's, but I think, that's I think really, venues, venues are really a, a, another opportunity for us to rethink right. where do mm -hmm. we put our music in bars, in schools, in parks, concert halls. Yes. But I think that's a great opportunity for us. I think that's that, that that's really creative. Uh, Christina, uh, you want to say something? Yes. Well, I was thinking for me, the evolved question or um, and the broad brush, like I feel like the, the most the thing that we need to do the most is think about serving our community. This idea of trying to model the Cleveland Orchestra, this, that, and the other, that's not it. We need to make sure that we are serving our community. So here in Arkansas, we don't have, we don't have string teachers really. So there's not a tradition of orchestra music. And so we have over the last three to five years built a program where we're recruiting, um, we're hiring people to play in the orchestra and teach violin. And we've got a program now where we're teaching three to 500 students, violin, cello, and viola. And in that process um, now, and that is serving our community. Our community didn't have it. We're serving it. It makes the orchestra play sound better because we've got wonderful players, but we're also adding value to our community in that we're employing more people and teaching more key people. And hopefully those kids are going to be transformed to be our future engineers and lawyers and everything else and teachers and musicians. Um, but I think the key is you've got to serve your community. Like we did a lot of outdoor free concerts during COVID um, and they were very well attended and no one cared about the venue. No one cared about what we were playing. No one really cared. They just wanted to be together, but it was breaking down all the rules. So that, anyway, so for me, I think the thing that symphony orchestras need to make sure that we're evolving fast enough to serving our community, our local community. You're making such an important point because sometimes we're captured by our preconceptions uh, in I've heard um, it often uh, said that either one is playing or one is teaching and it's better to be playing than, than, than teaching and so on. There's there's sort of a division and, and some sort of casting a sky, uh, you know, a a. a, a um, not an, not aspersion, but but sort of a, a sense of a hierarchy within. But what you're saying is, if you start off with creating joy within the community and connection to the music, whether it's through a performance or through teaching or through both, those are the barriers we have to break down for the vitality of of the art form for to retain your audience and so on. In fact, it's those attitudes that may be are counterproductive, Mieko. Do you see it this way as well? Is this, do you see it like an all in kind of a, kind of a thing where everybody is involved as an advocate and as a artist and as a teacher and. Definitely. Definitely. There is no such thing as art for art's sake anymore. And um, even though we are sort of, you know, the stewards and the culture holders in a lot of aspects, we have to involve our community in order to know what direction we need to go in. You know, where do people want to be hearing music? Where do people want, you, you know, um, want to gather together? Um, what do they want to be hearing? And it's not that we need to pull them and, and they're going to start programming concerts, but it's about being relevant to our community with the music that our community needs and serves it best. And so through music education, through you know, so many different opportunities that a symphony orchestra and truly only a symphony orchestra in a community can actually bring this. We're the largest you know, performing arts um, organization in any community. The symphony orchestra is the most powerful and usually the most stable. And so for us, even though we've been these monoliths, it's really our opportunity today to come and, and actually help our communities serve and to uplift some of the artists that are in our community who might be marginalized, who might not be represented, who might not have opportunities, but 
have incredible um, gifts of art to give to their community and to actually help us be able to be relevant to the entire community because they are representative. And so that's really where we need to be focused is, you know, yes, different venues, those kinds of things, but, but you know, those are all destinations. It's about where is the heart of the community and how do we serve that community best? That's really an important point. What you're, what you're saying is, is that your relevance is defined by audience embrace. And so it's a dialogue. It's not a monologue. It's not artists talking for art's sake uh, to audiences and saying, you must think I'm worthy. You must. You're, you're basically saying this is a dialogue where you're presenting the art. And if it's relevant, people will vote with their attendance. Elise, do you see it yeah. that way as well? Is this, is this more of a dialogue between oh, artists in which the audience also has a voice? Uh, very much so. And I think just as, as a executive directors, we prioritize that we make time for board meetings. We make time for all sorts of things. We need to make time and consistently reoccurring time to talk with those communities that we're talking about. And if that means talking to the teachers, to the Rotary Clubs, to the, to the whomever it is we're trying to serve. To the there's churches, to the... Constant, com there's a communication, not top down, not once off. What do you want to need and how can we continually serve you as, in this art form? I think that's, um, Mieko just hit it on the head. And yeah, I'm, I'm hoping we're all made, doing that. Yeah. You've also all made the point that, that it's also about welcoming in artists from the community, inviting, sponsoring art. Do you feel... Um, and I can't remember uh, who made the point. I think it was Christina, at least. Do you feel that it's important to also uh, sponsor new artists? In other words, um, uh, find ways to perform works that haven't been performed in the past or uh, even entirely new works. Yes, make the money available, make the space available and the time available as you would anything else. I think that's... Um, that's a mandate we have to take on. And guess what? You get great music out of it. You get wonderful, evocative musical experiences when we do that. I think we're just all blessed to be surrounded with wonderful artists, some who have been heard, some who have never had the chance. But it, that's our job. And, and we're big, sizable organizations. How lucky we are to be able to use this history that we have and this involvement with our communities in order to find these artists and say, Let's play your music and what matters to you. I think we're just fortunate to have that role. We're coming to the end of our time. Mieko, I'm going to give you give you a word, and then Christina will have the last word. Uh, and Mieko, if you could also uh, comment on this this question that you're always grappling with, right? The very familiar. You mentioned mm -hmm. Beethoven, for example, um, Beethoven, Mozart, and so on. The very familiar, the very traditional, the very, as Christina says, the very classical, um, which has an automatic audience and the unfamiliar, which, you know, is, is the area of risk. Uh, but, but I didn't want to step on your point. Uh, yeah, no, actually, I was just going to agree with Elise about our own responsibilities as executive directors. I also want to bring up our music directors, you know, and our artistic planning team. They need to be curious. They need to be going out into the community and going to other organizations, concerts, you know, other bands, other, you know, the cabaret, whatever is going on in the community and seeing and meeting those audiences as well. Because if your music director is isolated and you know only coming in for their own concert to give music, they're not getting music, right? They're not getting what the community is interested in. And so that curiosity from the executive director, from um, the music director, from the entire organization, it needs to go both ways. And that's how we bring more people to our stages from our community, the different organizations and artists. Um, in Oakland, we commission at least one new work every year. Um, and we're, we're always looking, especially inside of our community, who can, who is just doing amazing things and who can we uplift? So I just wanted to bring that point as well. Wonderful. I, just a wonderful, wonderful point. And Christina, you seem to have, have taken that uh, to, to, uh, to an art form, right? Uh, yes. Well, I, I think more voices at the table, um, is, is a great idea. I think about that with a music director. It, you know, we, we're an art form where we ask people to listen to us and then we need to make sure that we're listening more and having more listening to other voices at the table in our community there as well. 
Um, and I think that is so exciting, though. I think that's where the fun comes in and staying in that space of curiosity and staying in that place of new and innovative. And then I think about like, can we just make the new stuff familiar? I mean, Beethoven's familiar because we've played him a hundred million times, right? So we were like, we've commissioned James Lee third for next year. So we're going to play his piece twice on the same program. I mean, can we, we have this other rule that you have to play a piece every five years or you can't play it, but every five years, like let's break some of those rules for some of this new music or music that hasn't been heard before too. Why does that rule exist? Probably exists for Beethoven five because we have heard that a million times, but can we, can we add some more and listen to some more and make it familiar, make the unfamiliar familiar in a different way? So I'm of an age where I can actually remember the Leonard Bernstein lectures. I can actually remember that as a little kid. And I thought it was so wonderful to, to listen to him talk about characters that I was familiar with, Superman and, and, um, and uh, the Lone Ranger and, and so on, and, and do the reference uh, points and tell these, these uh, crazy stories, but also give me an appreciation of the structure of, of classical music. What you are doing it seems from different parts of the country, East Coast, West Coast, center of the country, it seems that what you're, what you're all saying is that this is a dialogue. It is centered on the audience. It is about audience engagement. It's about the art form. It's about uh, not necessarily disrespecting the classical, but not being limited uh, to it, which is your point, Christina. I'd like to thank you all, Elise Brunel, Executive Director of the Vermont Symphony Orchestra, Mieko Hatano, Executive Director of the Oakland Symphony in my neighborhood, and Christina Littlejohn, CEO of the Arkansas Symphony Orchestra. Please thank your artists, your art directors, your boards, your staffs, your funders, and your audiences and your communities for helping us to understand a little bit more of what you're doing. Uh, thank you so much. We're in your debt. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day, all. All right. You too.